This conference will together. now be recorded. And give me about two minutes. Two minutes. And if y'all got any questions, drop those questions in the chat. Um, because I know y'all don't want to talk while you're on the screen. If you want to go to this website, I dropped the hashi uh link inside of the chat. Um, if you do show bar, it is gonna show sidebar, it is, you'll go down to the learning uh situation where they got learned um for the certification. So give me about two minutes of that. Hold on. Uh, so, Laura, you ask if we don't have access, we're going to get there. Uh, we're going to um, build them out using Terraform. But I'm also going to, uh, I also want you all want to set up your your own stuff so you can practice um, and so forth. No big deal, though. All right. So um, while we had that open for that Terraform right there, let me pull up some other stuff to um for you to me and I want to get logged in I just want to show you the different things that I've used um so that you can pick and choose your own right pick and choose your own that's all I'm that's all I'm saying pick and choose your own all right okay so Oh, let me give me some power too. Uh oh, screen went down. I didn't mean to hit it. There we go. Pull this over. And then we're going to go through our Terraform guide. All right, so I got my Udemy up, so we're cool. All right, so the Terraform Associate Certification. Um, they walk through here that says, guys, through the, this guy, uh, list of resources you should study. You should study if you're preparing for the Terraform Associate Certification Exam. Um, from what I remember, it's multiple choice, uh, 60 questions. I think you get two hours for the exam. And you can, uh, then it's also, you can check out the Associate Certification Tutorials Collection to review all the tutorials linked below, right? Um, and they also have HashiCorp Cloud Engineer Certification. Um, so these are just, again, when we're talking about being, uh, so there's this thing in tech where everybody wants to be, um, either they want to be a an L shape or T shape. Really, we try to push the T shape. When I talk about this, uh, uh, let me go back, uh, T shape. Um, skills, right, right here. Uh, 
So the term T shape uh, com skills is common in the agile software development world and refers to the need for cross skill developers and testers in an agile in an agile team. So let me see if they got a I may have to go to the website. Cause I really want you to get an idea of what that looks like. All right, here we go right here. So when I mention things right like your terraform your ansible your cloud pick a cloud any cloud linux um and you can really do any linux what's most recognized is the rcsa um and then kubernetes um with along with kubernetes comes a list of things too like there's kubernetes just vanilla kubernetes and then there's OpenStack. I mean, not OpenStack, but OpenShift, and then there's Rancher, and then there is GKE, AKS, and then there is AKS, GKE, and EKS, right? So when I say those things, GKE is Google Cloud, AKS is Azure, um, EKS is um, uh, Amazon, right? So which means they have managed services meaning that it's native to their cloud. So I showed you this last week, if I go to cloud.google.com um, and I hit console here and then I go over here and I and I hit um, on the menu and I go down to Kubernetes engine. And then I say, oh, okay, I wanna create a, a cluster. I could use autopilot, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. We'll we'll come back. We'll come back to that on uh, another time, right? Let's go here. Uh, pay pay per node cluster where you can figure and manage your nodes, or you can use autopilot or whatnot. We we'll go with autopilot for now. We'll go with autopilot. I haven't used autopilot yet, but let's go there. All right. So I'm gonna leave everything default. It's a public cluster. Here are my networking options. <laughs> uh you can get into all of that i'll just take everything as default for right now for right now and we'll come back and do this later but this is set, deploying a kubernetes cluster i'm manually and i want to clarify that manually or uh deploying a gke cluster in google cloud you can see here where they have an overview of gke they have a quick start about explaining autopilot use cases cluster architecture i personally me just my own personal thoughts i think learning google cloud is is easier just my own personal thought i think the interface for google cloud is easier to to learn there that's my own personal thoughts um and so here we go create so now you can see it start spinning up here then you can see now it's building out my autopilot. It's gonna give me a public IP. It's gonna give me, uh, it's gonna create and give me access to this actual um, cluster and so forth. Well, why are you showing us that Tamika? We still wanna learn Linux. We're still talking about Linux. Well, what I'm showing you is when, when, what I just did, I just built it manually. So what happens? on a team when I come in here to do it manually. Well, number one, there's no state um, of what of what, what I just did. Remember last week we talked about uh, having that state and let me make this smaller. All right, so clear. So when I go here to digital, uh, this is still connected to digital ocean. When I go Terraform, um refresh or terraform show let's do terraform show it, it, it gives me nothing and when i do refresh it says non-existent right and then when i do um uh, terraform destroy I might've got rid of the uh, thing. Yeah, no changes, no objects needed to be destroyed. Either you have not created in the objects or anything. So what happened last week was I used Terraform to deploy instances out to DigitalOcean. And when I deployed those instances, 
right? I, I, I ended up with a terraform.tf state file that said, hey, I'm going to keep and uh, 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 I'm going to keep an idea and uh, control of what's being deployed out on digital ocean. So anytime you need to come back and try to figure out what you got deployed, I know what you got. I got you covered. Doing it this way with this me manually doing this, I don't know what's out there. That means I have to log into the console of Google Cloud to figure out what's out there. Um, my team members don't know what's out there. They don't know what work has been done. They don't know what you actually did. So this is why we have those pipelines. This is why we we go through the, the process of automating stuff. This is why we have the Jira tickets. This is why we have our, our meetings in the morning and so forth. This is what that comes from, right? So with that being said, once this gets, gets spun up, and we're not going to do GKE just yet. We're not going to do it just yet. I'm not going to hit you with that just yet. We're going to get to the point where we're going to go to Terraform. We're going to look at the registry, the Terraform registry for Google Cloud. We're going to look up and try to find um, the actual uh, actual uh, Terraform code that we need to use to deploy a cluster inside of Google Cloud without coming to the console. I want you all to be real familiar with the command line. It's your friend. It is a, it's command line saves lives. Let's say that. <laughs> command line saves lives. Okay. All right. So I want you to get used to that. All right. And pull this over so I can see who all is here. Is everybody okay so far? Any questions? Yeah, it's gonna prompt you for a credit card, and then you, uh, then you get rid of. Then when it, when it, it'll let you know when your time is up. So then you like, oh no, give me that back. So, Louis, you said you had a question. No, I was just adding to the question with the credit card because uh, I had the same thing. They asked me for a credit card as well. And it's just more along the lines of if you're looking to do things more that than the free stuff that they give you, they have some way to charge you. Mm -hmm. All right. So no questions so far. Everybody's it's cool with Terraform. We Terraforming. We know what it is. You know who makes Terraform? You know about that? That's right, Hashi. All right. And they went public last year. All right, so that's still doing this thing. So, and it takes a long time for these things to go. This is what I mean about, see, now you're sitting here and you're watching this spin and you're like, oh my goodness, how long does this take? All right, still going. So, but we could click in here. Let me click and then let me do that. So as we hear, you see here, it's configuring, it's deploying, it's doing some health checks, but notice what happened. It deployed some nodes for me in US Central A, US Central 1A, B, C, and F. So notice that the cluster it deployed, it deployed in a redundant manner across the zones. So if I remember that conversation I had earlier, if I took a wrench and threw it at A, will my application still work? Yes, in B, C, and F. And the thing about Kubernetes is it's, it's also uh, self-healing as well too, right? Self-healing meaning you throw something at me, cool. I'm, I'm gonna go down, but guess what? We fall down, but we get up, right? <laughs> that cracked me up. Anyway. So that's what you got there. Notice they have a GKE version right here, 122.11 uh, GKE 400. Now, you say, what does this have to do with Linux? Most of this is, not most of it, all of it is Linux based. Inside of Google Cloud, I believe in AWS, I think you can deploy Windows Kubernetes clusters. I'm not sure, I have to though or verify that. They may have something set up for that, but I'm not sure. I have to double verify that. 
not sure. Uh, but I want you to note that um, the endpoint right here, meaning this is the public IP address in which I'm gonna be able to connect to. Um, and then they got my certificate right here. So I can go in and grab that certificate and do my deployments. Um, I can configure that from my command line. I also then have my pod uh, address range, meaning, and I don't want to get into pods and, and the old balancers and all the uh, resisting. I don't do it. Uh, pods. All right. Jesus Christ. Uh, was it Fifi goes to the zoo, Kubernetes, uh, I said it right, Kubernetes, Ooh, you spell it right, okay, all right, so, yeah, here we go, so, years ago, uh, they they came out. CNCF came out with a coloring book to um uh, to explain what Kubernetes is, and they made this little uh little thing. I don't know. Are you okay to sit through this for? Uh, I don't want to do it, but it's eight minutes long. Are y'all okay with that? To get so I don't have to explain it. I let Fifi and them do it and do the explaining. It's Fifi. Right. It's Fifi. 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 <laughs> I love Fifi. Let me queue up Fifi. Gippy. GG. All right. So um, let's do this one because this is look like this is original from CNCL. All right. The other day. My daughter sidled into my office and asked me, dearest father, whose knowledge is incomparable, what is Kubernetes? All right, that's a little bit of a paraphrase, but you get the idea. And I responded, Kubernetes is an open source orchestration system for Docker containers. It handles scheduling onto nodes in a compute cluster and actively manages workloads to ensure that their state matches the user's declared intentions. Using the concept of labels, pods, it groups the containers which make up an application into logical units for easy management and discovery. And my daughter said to me, huh? And so I give to you the illustrated children's guide to Kubernetes. Once upon a time, there was an app named Fippy, and she Fippy. was a simple app she was written in PHP and had just one page. She lived on a hosting provider and she shared her environment with scary other apps that she didn't know and didn't care to associate with. She okay, listen to what he was saying here. He, he, what he was saying there, he said, okay, he said there's there are, there are other apps that are on this cluster um, and with them on this cluster, these other apps, um, people are deploying these applications. They're all on the same cluster. So we have to have a way to designate them in their own spaces. And, and in order to do that, we create these spaces called namespaces. Now, ironically, ironically, when you go look at, when you deploy a container, on your Linux boxes, we use C groups. It's still all related, right? And so what ends up happening is we, and this is where SE Linux comes into play. We don't want you to be able to break out of your little section that you that, that you're in and then spill over into somebody else's namespace or somebody else's application. We want separation of that. So that's why when I say go on the command line, look at the log files, look and see what's going on with these things, this is the same thing, all right? This is the other thing to take note of this as well too is when you're, when you're doing this, right? You also have to monitor who has access 
to get access to deploy those applications, right? And what kind of access do they have? For example, um, when you go to the store, say you go into, um, when you go into Best Buy and you walk in um, and you got, you got, you go into a particular section to buy something. You don't go to the, you don't go in the Best Buy, even though it may be a good idea for Best Buy. You don't go in the Best Buy, pick something up off the shelf and then go ring yourself up, right? You don't, you don't do that. You go in the Best Buy, you look at the product, you get the product, you walk over to uh, a desk or you walk over to someone who has the ability, again, talking about security here, talking about access, who has the ability to then check you out, right? But here's the other thing, when that person checks you out, they don't have, they don't have access to your credit card, your account per se, right? They have to log in or you have to give them permission in order to do certain things, right? They ask you to verify stuff. They ask you, hey, is this your blah, 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 blah. But you, you freely give that up, right? They don't just look at you and just say, oh, I know who you are and then go look up your information. You give them access to do that. And they, they have to have access, a, a particular type of access in order to look up your name in some type of database and so forth and so on. Is everybody following along with that? It's all about the controlling people from being able to do whatever they want. Same way with your Gmail account. It's the same way with your AWS account. I don't have access to do whatever I want in your account. You have to give me some type of access in order to do that. But you also want to control the type of access that I get. You don't want me to be just in there just setting up uh, bare metal servers and GPUs and letting them run for two weeks. Um, <laughs> you know, you don't like that. All right, so let's get back to it. I wish she had her own environment, just her and a web server she could call home. An app has an environment that it relies upon to run. For a PHP app, that environment might include a web server, a readable file system, and the PHP engine itself. One day, a kindly whale came along. He suggested that little Fippy might be happier living in a container. And so she moved. The container was nice, but was a little bit like having a fancy living room floating in the middle of the ocean. A container provides an isolated context in which an app, together with its environment, can run. But those isolated containers often need to be managed and connected to the external world. Shared file systems, networking, scheduling, load balancing, and distribution are all challenges. The whale shrugged its shoulders. Sorry, kid, he said, and disappeared beneath the ocean's surface. But before Fippy could even begin to despair, a captain appeared on the horizon piloting a gigantic ship. The ship was made of dozens of rafts all lashed together. But from the outside, it looked like one huge boat. Hello there, little PHP app. My name is Captain Kubi, said the wise old captain. Kubernetes is the Greek word for a ship's captain. We get the words cybernetic and gubernatorial from it. Led by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the Kubernetes project focuses on building a robust platform for running thousands of containers in production. All right, so let me stop it right here. So Kubernetes used to actually comes from Google Cloud, uh, actually comes from Google. It used to be called Cyborg, reminiscent of Cyborg from Star Trek, right? Um, and then they're, they, they have been using it for years and then they made it open source and now everybody has adopted um, uh, Kubernetes, CNCF, they're part of the CNCF project. Um, remember that, that landscape 
uh, the CNCF landscape that I talked about last week. Uh, excuse me, this is a part of that. And um, because they were using it, uh, p other people have adopted it, such as your um, Azure, such as your GCP, even Oracle has the Kubernetes cluster. Um, even DigitalOcean has a Kubernetes cluster too. They just came out with theirs about two years ago, maybe three. I think it's been about two, maybe in three. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But they also have one as well too. So again, this is just this is the other end of of Linux. So Linux is your baseline foundation. Um, automation infrastructure is code. Um, then you have to do understand security is as code or policy as code and then you start getting into uh, orchestration of containers because i can give you 50 containers that have 50 different applications on them and you can go deploy them but how do you manage them how do you make sure that they're self-healing how do you make sure that um they're not spilling over how do you make sure uh that the security of those machines are, are fine how do you make sure that the container that you deploy doesn't have a known vulnerability in it. How do you manage that, right? So when we when we look at networking, security, um, DNS, um, routing, um, content, building automated containers, uh, infrastructure as code, all that, all of this is a part of of this so that t-shape that i wanted that i was talking about earlier where you have cross cross skills those are the cross skills that i'm talking about and then you can choose to go specialize in containers and security you can choose to go specialize in networking of of of, of a particular kubernetes cluster or networking in the cloud you can go down the the, the rabbit hole of application security you can even get into the storage of, of of a kubernetes cluster you can even get into how do you do policy um create policies to prevent people from from harming themselves right so there's when we talk about tech and we talk about infrastructure that i'm just i'm just really hitting the tip of the iceberg of what the possibilities are. They all relate back to Linux. They all re relate back to some type of command line. They all relate back to you understanding how to do automated deployments, GitLab, all of this is still relevant. So I, I want to I want I want you to I want you to understand that the RACSA is just your foundation and everything else around it kind of you know kind of everything around it touches that as your baseline. I hope that made sense for y'all. Hi, I'm Fippy, said the little app. Nice to make your acquaintance, said the captain as he slapped a name tag on her. Kubernetes uses labels as name tags to identify things, and it can query based on these labels. Labels are open-ended. You can use them to indicate roles, stability, or other important attributes. Captain Kubi suggested that the little app might like to move her container into a pod on board the ship. Fibby happily moved to Kubi's giant boat, and it felt like home. In Kubernetes, a pod represents a runnable unit of work. Usually, you'll run a single container inside of a pod, but for cases where a few containers are tightly coupled, may opt to run more than one container inside of the same pod. Kubernetes takes on the work of connecting your pod to the network and to the rest of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Tippy had some unusual interests. She was really into genetics and sheep. And so she asked the captain, um, what if I wanted to clone myself? on demand any number of times. Well, that's easy, said the captain, and he introduced her to the replica sets. Replica sets provide a method for managing an arbitrary number of pods. A replica set contains a pod template, which can be replicated any number of times. Through the replica set, Kubernetes will manage your pod's life cycle, 
including scaling up and down, uh, rolling deployments, and monitoring. For many days and nights, the little app was happy with her pod and happy with her replicas. But only having yourself for company is not all it's cracked up to be, even if it is n copies of yourself. Captain Kubi smiled benevolently. I have just the thing, he said. No sooner had he spoken than a tunnel opened between Fippy's replica set and the rest of the ship. With a hearty laugh, Captain Kubi said, even when your clones come and go, this tunnel will stay here so you can discover other pods and they can discover you. A service tells the rest of the Kubernetes environment, including other pods and replica sets, what services your application provides. While pods may come and go, the IP address and ports of your service remain the same and other applications can find your service through Kubernetes Service Discovery. All right, so that's an important piece, service discovery. You're gonna learn about service discovery when you start playing with console. And so what does that mean? What, why is that so big? Why do we care about that? Because you may have a service out there that I may need to utilize. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna have to tie that into my application when it's already out there, right? And that service, to, in, along with that service discovery, we're talking also about time. We're also talking about quickness, right? So console from Hashi, um, and then there are other ones, we work at, we work has theirs. When we start talking about, but we're sticking with Hashi, when we start talking about console and service discovery, console handles that on a Kubernetes cluster. Now, here's another thing about Kubernetes. Not everybody needs Kubernetes. Some people just like the buzzword and they just go and build a Kubernetes cluster and they really don't need it. It's, it, it is, it could be more work than necessary. It could be overkill, right? So you have to know when to use it and when not to use it. What business case? Docker has their own, Docker, Docker Swarm, right? Rancher has their own. With, with basically Kubernetes Rancher, but they have their own orchestration, right? Um, Red Hat has their own, which is OpenShift, right? So you have to figure out which one is going to be the best use case in order to build this. You as the person who's doing security, you as the person that is the scrum master, you as the person that is the infrastructure person, you even as the person that is the owner of the company, right people are looking to you for guidance and for you for your expertise and you need to know when and when not to use it you also need to know the why you also need to know the pros and the cons so the only way you're going to get there is you're going to have to play with it you're going to have to read on documentation you're going to have to look at you're going to have to look at what the actual customer is actually aiming to do but not only that you also have to look at the skill set of the people that they have and this is very important because most of the time when you go into these places a lot of people don't have the this knowledge level so you become the brand ambassador you become the person that has that expertise and you become the person that has to help them get to where they need to be why am i telling you this this is where you make your money at not your money like upselling them. You make money on upselling people from a sales perspective. But this is where you make your money at, where we start talking about the 150, the 200, the 250, the 500 dollars an hour. This is where you start making that money at because we're looking at you to come in and tell us what we need to do. We're looking at you for for the gotchas, the things that we should consider. Um, I want to build uh, a, a GKE cluster in Google Cloud, but I want to have a certain number of GPUs um, and so forth. Oh, well, you need to have some type of relationship with uh, the, that particular service provider so they can provide you uh, when you need when when those particular GPUs are available. Excuse me for you to do your AI machine learning. Um, you may want to do some some type of data analysis or something of that nature. 
You may even want to get the latest and greatest um, particular processor so you can use that and you're selling that back to your customer. So here's another thing, another way to look at um, tech. A lot of you probably think about being employed, but there's another level of being a partner. So you can be a Red Hat partner, you could be a Azure partner, you could be a um, partner to a AWS. What happens with that? Those are people that go in and have taken these exams and it depends on how you look at it too, that may sell uh, at AWS, they may sell a product, you may sell training, you may sell these things. Again, I'm looking at when, when, when you go into this from that perspective, you end up looking at training, you end up taking the training and you end up pretty much like I represent this brand and I'm gonna, I can sell these services to you. People like Shadowsoft comes to mind. Um, and then there are other, other people that I know that are actually, uh, I think it's called Venturi, V-E-N, T-U-R-I, I think that's the name of them. They're also um, um, Red Hat partners. Shadowsoft is a Red Hat partner, but they're also an AWS partner as well too. So keep that in mind. This is this is how we this is how you change the perspective. That's why I say you have to see yourself as a business. This is what I talk about on Saturdays. Looking at yourself as a business. Thanks to the services, Fippy began to explore the rest of the ship. It wasn't long before Fippy met Goldie, and they became the best of friends. One day, Goldie did something extraordinary. She gave Fippy a present. Fippy took one look, and the saddest of sad tears escaped her eyes. Mm -mm -mm. Why are you so sad? asked Goldie. Oh. I love the present, but but I have nowhere to put it, sniffled Fippy. Goldie knew what to do. Why not put it in a volume? A volume represents a location where containers can access and store information. For the application, the volume appears as part of the local file system, but volumes may be backed by local storage, Ceph, Bluster, Azure Files, Elastic Block Storage, or any number of other storage backends. Fippy loved life aboard Captain Kubi's ship, and she enjoyed the company of her new friends. Every replicated pod of Goldie was equally delightful. But as she thought back to her days on the scary hosting provider, she began to wonder if perhaps she could also have a little bit of privacy. Sounds like what you need, said Captain Kuby, is a namespace. A namespace functions as a grouping mechanism inside of Kubernetes. Services, pods, replica sets, and volumes can easily cooperate within a namespace. But the namespace provides a degree of isolation from the other parts of the cluster. Together with her new friends, Fippy sailed the seas on Captain Kuby's great boat. She had many grand adventures, but most importantly, Fippy had found her home. And so Fippy lived happily ever after. The end. So that's what they came out with <laughs> from CNCF. It's actually a coloring book to talk about the basics of um, Kubernetes. So back to, I see your question, Lori. Back to the um, autopilot here. Remember that pod he just talked about? My pod contains my application, right? So this is why we was looking at it, right? So I have an IP address for that. Remember that service he was talking about? My services, uh, are following this address range. I have a set of nodes. So let me go over here and look up Kubernetes um, illustration. 
And then let's look at images. Um, yeah, this this will work. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, so I think that's big on your screen. Maybe, maybe, there we go. So um, there is a what we call a CKA exam, certified Kubernetes uh, administrator, and then there's a CKD exam, certified Kubernetes developer, and then there's a CKS exam, certified Kubernetes security expert. I think it's expert. Um, but as a baseline for Kubernetes, you would need to know like the they changed the name from master to Kubernetes main host. And then what is contained in that main host? And then the nodes that are here. And notice that that there's a redundancy line from here to here. What you see in my in my um, Kubernetes, deployment of my gke cluster you see i got four nodes so and they all know about each other right and they and they all can talk to each other and they all and they all have and they're all controlled by one main node right and they're all controlled by one main node and inside of that um on my kubernetes cluster um, I have this control called kubelet, which allows me to uh, deploy to it. And then I have my pods, which contain my Docker containers, my application. That storage that they were talking about, those are that uh, follow along with AWS. Um, you can use object stores, you can use block storage and so forth, EBS stores or whatnot. Same thing with your G, uh, GCP, their block storage same way with um, um, Oracle Cloud and so forth, right? You can you can uh, you can attach block storage uh, ephemeral ephemeral I'm I know I messed that up ephemeral 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 storage uh, on your cluster. I know I was gonna mess that word up. All right, so back to what we were doing. So inside of all the way back. Inside of Terraform, let me pull this up, pull this over. We'll put it right next to each other. Uh, Terraform has, uh, I went to the registry, right? And Google to container cluster, right? Manages a Google GKE cluster. Um, and I'm gonna deploy using this uh, Terraform code. They also have it right here where I can go out and use this um, Terraform uh, uh, G Cloud to deploy. But here they got it, you know, right here, right at the um, command line level for me to, to do my deployment. But here's where you actually start getting into it. We don't want to do data. We actually need, um, we actually need resource. So here, the resource is the default account here for Kubernetes, I mean, not for Kubernetes, but for your Google Cloud account. Here, you're giving it the location of where you want this to, to, to be. Um, how many nodes do you want to deploy? You just want one node or two or three or four, right? Um, and then here, you go in, uh, the node pool is what you saw deployed with my four, which and what size machine type that you want to deploy and so forth, right? And so you can use that to actually deploy, you can take that default stuff, you can take this default right here and deploy a actual Kubernetes cluster on GCP, right? Remember they talked about labels, remember I talked about tags, so my open open policy agent inside of Terraform Cloud, I can say if these if this cluster isn't tagged, it won't deploy. It'll it'll stop it'll stop and say you need to go back and check, make sure that you have tags added to it. Um, I can have this also check my open policy agent on my Sentinel. My I can also have it check to say well if you deploy more than three notify someone that they're deploying more than three nodes um, and why you, and then you have to give a, a reason of why you're deploying more than 
three dollars. Lori had a question on uh, how do you take on the role of the partner? Um, just simple. Um, you can go GCP partners. You can do the same thing with AWS. Um, if you went over here to um, see partner advantage program, uh, our partners have certified blah blah blah. Find a partner, or you can become a partner. So let's go back on GCP and GCP become. Oh, here we go. Become a GCP partner. Here we go. All right. So here, the walk you through enrolling that um, rewarding program built with with our partners. And there's certain things that you got to meet, right? Certain criteria, right? So do you want to do a business, enhance your partner experience through uh, the program-based support to grow your business? You want to be technical? You want to do marketing? You want to do sales? You don't have to always be technical in order to do the marketing side of, 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 of selling uh, GCP or Red Hat or AWS. You can do the marketing side or you can do the sales side, I should say, where you're just selling their products to them and then you bring in an engineering team to help you with that sale, right? So there's different ways in order to uh, become a partner and there are different type of partnerships as well too. AWS has a big partner uh, uh, program, Red Hat has a partner program, Oracle, um, digital ocean there's I don't know too many people that don't have partner programs where you can uh, do that where did you find that Google documentation page with all that code uh, you're talking about the terraform that's the terraform registry so you go if you just type in terraform registry in fact I just go here um, you can look you can see browse per for, for providers so if I go to browse for providers, it's going to give me all the providers um, that are that are that are associated with building out Terraform. So like I said before, you can build out vanilla Kubernetes, right? You can literally go to Kubernetes.io and you can build out a you can download Kubernetes. There's the documentation. They got training and so forth. You can literally come here and just build out your own Kubernetes cluster. Now, what happens with that when I say that? That means it's not managed by anyone but you. That means you got to put things in place in order to make that happen, right? Uh, so again, um, cloud native versus and managed is very different. You can build Kubernetes clusters on your own um, and, and go from there. Let's go here and learn the basics. So they got the basis of Kubernetes. What can Kubernetes do for you? And as you can look here, they have right down the side, right here, tutorials on uh, build, use uh, Minikube, learn the basis, learn how to create a cluster, deploy an app, explore your app, expose your app publicly, scale your app, update your app. Here's about configuration, security, state list, state false services. And then they got a whole reference library, right? And then it got some basis on the, on the concepts, right? Um, storage, configuration, security policies, evic evicting up a, a, a pod, cluster administration, extending, so forth, right? Now, over the years, the, the, it didn't used to be this way. It didn't used to be uh, uh, this laid out. It's, they've gotten better. Um, here's their blogs. Here's their training. You can take free courses over on edX uh, right here. What's, what what do you see right here? Some type in the chat what you see right there that I keep talking about, that I keep telling you is your baseline. <laughs> Linux is your baseline, right? Um, uh, introduction to cloud infrastructure technologies and introduction to Kubernetes. Those are all free, right? Um, and of course they have a whole community where you can go deep dive into their meetups, into their videos. Um, if you want to get familiar with their weekly videos and so forth, I'm a part of the community. I, I attend some of these meetings sometimes and so forth, right? 
So, um, and then uh, again, know the why. Why would I use Kubernetes? Read, start reading case studies. When people say they're using something in AWS, ask them why know the why if they're using something some type of service inside of gcp know the why go read case studies um this is going to help propel you to understand the use cases the business cases uh again um, sometimes people are solving the same problems over and over again you don't have to recreate the wheel you can go with what somebody already has right um there's an article that i wanted to um that i wanted to actually talk about this weekend um I, i'm gonna pull it up real quick but i i, I want i want to caution you on some cer certain things um about it right so let me let me go to my slack and pull this up um real quick oh uh, did i not save it no, I did. All right. So we're going to bring this over. Um, here it says the biggest multi cloud mistake people are making to optimize your multi cloud architecture, know what your business specifically needs, and avoid the trap or vendor think. And this happens a lot. I've been on many of projects where they want me to come in as the expert and help them guide them to the cloud, the cloud migration. Um, I, believe it or not, a lot of your state, a lot of your federal places are still behind and they're not in the cloud. Or if they are in the cloud, they're in a hybrid situation or they're in a multi-cloud situation. And what ends up happening is all the times they'll get someone on the phone from the vendor on the phone from aws gcp this that and other and they're gonna throw everything aws they're gonna throw everything uh uh aws they're gonna throw everything gcp everything that's related to the vendor why because i want to sell you everything that we got that's what i'm gonna do right so it, in here it says i can tell by the hits on this blog that multi-cloud is more than a trend it's is now drives much of the thinking about how we build and deploy cloud-based solutions. Most shifts in thinking, particularly pivots in how we do architecture, come come about by come about in a uh, by good old trial and error. We learn from those mistakes again. Everybody has probably been through the same thing. There are some things that are new, but pretty much you're doing the same thing over and over. All right, uh, and and at different phases. Um, as usual, most of these mistakes are avoidable the second time around. What's the biggest repeat mistake I see? It's really an old mistake under the guise of new technology, vendor think. Vendor think is the practice of allowing the vendors to lead your architecture decisions rather than the other way around. When the vendor di dictates how a client will use its technology to address an enterprise use case, the stage is set for multi-cloud to go off the rails. And this happens a lot where you, the resident expert, um, may not be working for Google. You may not be working for AWS. You're that T-shaped person that comes in. You know GCP, you know AKS, you know DigitalOcean, you know Oracle. That's just who you are because you because you came out of, out of women in Linux. You just that, you just popping like that, right? Then you get in the meetings and they was like, we got AWS on the phone and whatever they say we're going with, and can you do that? And you're like, well, that didn't make sense to do X, Y, and Z because it's gonna cost you this amount and it would be better to do blah, 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 blah. But they don't know. But you know who knows? AWS, they know how much it's gonna cost you. They know how much they are gonna charge you. And so that's what ends up happening. So you have to come in with your calculator, with what you're trying to do, with what you can do, uh, what you know will work. And on top of that, you have to also look at what that offering looks like. And when I say that, 
I'm talking about the people who are working, who have to do the work after you leave as the contractor, after you leave as the partner. Who, who knows how to do that work? Do they know how to do it? Are, are, are they gonna go to class to do it? Um, this is kind of like you as the partner can upsell with your training. Uh, if you have in-house training or you can sell them training, um, you can upsell and say, I can stay on for another additional cost for uh, for a another uh, three to six months of a contract. I could train your people. Uh, we can hold training classes, X, Y, and Z days. Um, it depends. All depends on you, right? But again, what normally happens is the vendor starts to dictate what the customer is going to do versus what the customer needs, right? And so you end up in this battle of, well, how much is that going to cost? And so it ends up being like, oh, snap, it's going to cost us $40,000 to do this, not the initial twenty. And they'd be like, yeah, that's an additional 40. And if you want us to stay on because we're running out of hours, um, you're gonna have to talk and, and put us in for another additional 100,000 because that's how much it is gonna be for our team to do this deployment, right? So you may be, you may be as a partner, you may be on a project and it may, it may be a cool million, 2 million, 50 million, 20 million, 30 million, it depends. It depends on the project. Smaller projects may be, um, a smaller project may be 100,000 or it may be 200,000, it depends. But most of the projects are typically bigger. But the more you get people certified on your team and able to, to speak and to work and to do those things, the better you are, right? As a partner or even as a consultant. All right. So <clears throat> we got that resource on over here from building out that GKE cluster. We stood up our GKE, GKE cluster, and now you want to learn Terraform as well, all right? So here, back to uh, learn infrastructure, about infrastructure as code, about managing infrastructure, what providers are, the purpose of Terraform state, Terraform settings. Um, how do we, how do I share my, Terraform state with you. So when I tell you to go build a Terraform, uh, when I tell you to build Terraform, when I tell you to use Terraform to build a GKE cluster in my Google Cloud account, and you all go out and build a Google Cloud account, I mean, Google Cloud account, when you all go build out a GKE cluster, you want to know well, what's already out there because you can't build the cluster with the same name, right? You want to build it with a different name, right? Provisioners. Uh, we'll, and they'll get into all of that. And then they talk about the workflow. This is an important piece. This is what I kind of went over last week, not kind of, but I did. When we initialize and we validate and we plan and we format and we apply and we destroy it. Understand the Terraform workflow uh, and then learn about more of the commands, like subcommands. What does the formatting do? What does tainting do? State. Um, working in workspaces when you're creating your Terraform files, your import. So say I got that, here's another thing. I just built that cluster that's out there, right? So now what I would need to do if I'm gonna use Terraform, I would want to import that cluster into my state. So now when I import it into my state, Terraform knows that that cluster is out there now versus it just it's just out there willy nilly. Now I'm importing it in and like, oh, it is a cluster right there. You've imported it in and guess what? I now know that it exists. And so now from Terraform's perspective, uh, from the CLI, I can now control the, the destruction of that. I can deploy to that particular uh, um, Kubernetes cluster. I can, do, I can manipulate that particular cluster because now I've imported that, right? And so then they talk about how to create modules um, and what do you need to do with that, um, how to read and write configurations, what's a resource, what's a data source, how to query for data sources, name values, CRDs, the list goes on, manage your state, state locking, backend management right here, um, and then how to debug. This is all on the exam and it's multiple choice. You got to be able to read and understand 
uh, what the actual question is asking, what the code is actually doing, and so forth. And then there is, um, let me go back up here. I think I might have went too far. Yeah, right here. Uh, the sample questions, they give you the sample questions, they give you an idea, true or false, uh, multiple choice, and then like reading this right here, I'm creating a, var a variable called VPC CIDRs. I'm creating a map of variables, uh, US each one, so forth and so on. And now I'm having this resource that I'm building called, uh, building this resource, uh, AWS VPC, called shared and then CIDR block. And it says, how would you define the CIDR block for US East one in AWS uh, VPC resource using a variable? Would you do it this way, this way, this way, or this way? And what they're trying to show you is, is how do you use the map? Uh, how do you use map when it's defined as a map? How do you get uh, US East one? How do you get just the first is the first instance the first position of this map declared in inside your uh cider block here is it bar dot v uh vpc ciders so forth and so on right and so that's what they want to know do you know how to do that just a wild guess what do you think which one it is a b c or d just just wild guess randomly just drop something in the chat what do you think Derek said d I see a B and a D. I see a C. Don't be afraid to answer. It's okay. You've never seen it before. It's all right. I see a lot of C's. I see an A. Let me see. I think that's, I saw two D's. I see three A's. I see three C's. <laughs> all right. All right, where were the most stops? Any, meaning, money, mo. We get D. What y'all thinking? C. Remember, it's a map. All right, let's try this one. Oh, is it not letting me do it? Oh, man. It won't let me do it. All right, answer. Here's the answer. A is the correct answer. Somebody have an A? All right, A is the correct answer. So var uh, VPC ciders, and then in quotes, they got uh, uh, this one, US East one. I knew it wasn't this one and this one. I wasn't sure if it was D or not, because it's the actual, the first position. So yeah, I would have went with D myself. All right, it's now it says uh, you have defined the values for your variables in a Terraform file, terraform.tf bars. We kind of went over this last week. And it says, and you want to use uh, and save it to the directory as as your, as your same directory as your Terraform program, which following command would you use? It's actually, uh, I think it's a um, B. Oh, C, all of the above. Terraform, oh, it's in the same directory. That's the trick. It's in the same directory. So it's going to automatically look for the terraform.tfrs file, but you can force it to give it a, a path of where that terraform virus is at. All right. Let's see if you know this one. Which of the following terraform commands will automatically refresh the state unless supplied with additional flags or, or flags or arguments? Two of them are correct. No guesses. I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess. Um, Terraform output, and I'm gonna guess Terraform state. Let's see what the answer is. Oh, supply and plan. That's interesting. Got it wrong. Which one will refresh the state unless applied? Refre I guess plan does refresh the state. Apply does refresh the state. But when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about not applying. And see, I'll refresh the with a 
unless supplied with additional flags or, or arguments. Hmm. Got it wrong. What happens when you apply Terraform configuration? Choose two that are correct. Terraform makes an inf any infrastructure changes to find in your configuration. Gets the plugin. It says the, the plot, the word is apply. What happens when you apply? Updates the state file, corrects the formatting, destroys and, and creates your, your infrastructure from scratch. What do you think? It is this one. Updates the state file and then makes any infrastructure changes to find in your configuration. Now, it, it would destroy and recreate if you did have something in there that was going to change, right? If you had something in there that was going to change, give me a Linux question. Uh-uh, no Linux question. And then, but they changed their study guide. They used to didn't have this much, it wasn't this detailed. Um, and closer to the exam before. It's just much, much better. All right. All right. So that's that one. Now, what I wanted to show you here was this is Udemy. So you can see you can go and get the Udemy class for HashiCorp Vault. You can get the associate exam for 2022, as well as just the exam. Um, and then you can also get a class on GitLab as well too. I've had I don't I hardly ever come in here and use these. Let me see what else do I have in here. Um, introduction to Kubernetes using Docker. FYI, Kubernetes by default doesn't use Docker anymore. They use CR CR we call it Cry Cry IO uh, dash I CRI dash O um, as its baseline runtime. For Red Hat, their runtime is Podman. Um, I'm trying to see what else is in here. Oh, yeah, AWS. Actually, that was from 2020. You see, I ain't even start. Right? So the best time to buy classes is the end, <laughs> the end of the year when they have their Christmas sale or the black or the, or the holiday sales. All right? So that is what you get for that. Here, what we're going to do with this here, I'm going to change all of these. Um, eventually, and we're gonna deploy our, our we're gonna we're not gonna deploy uh, GKE just yet. We deploy just regular instances out on DigitalOcean or uh, what or AWS or whatnot. So let me get y'all used to some things here. Let's go back to Terraform Registry. This is how you find out how you do it with AWS. So you come here, you have AWS. Um, and you can see here they have different modules for VPCs, EKS automatically pops right up there. But you eventually want a um, EC2 instance. Let me see. Uh, I hate when they do it this way. Okay, here we, here we go. Um, EC2. All right, so. When you come here and you're reading and you want to deploy an AW, you want to deploy something in AWS, you're going to need the provider, right? And let me pull that back up. Because this is what I want y'all to be able to do come next week. So let's get our baseline set up. Okay. I'm not going to worry about workspaces right now. Um, but I could. All right, so we'll do Terraform uh, workspace. Well, we'll do Terraform help. Dash help. And we're going to use this right here, workspace. Right? So we'll do Terraform workspace. Let's see if I do dash help. Will it give me yep. All right, so it gives me another list of commands. So Terraform workspace, I can do new list, show, select, or delete. I want to do a new workspace. So I'll do Terraform workspace, new, and I'll name it uh, TF Wednesday, whatever, Terraform Wednesday. All right, it says created and it automatically switched me into that workspace 
you're you're now um, on, in your new empty workspace. Your workspace isolates their state, so that if you run a Terraform plan, uh, Terraform would not see anything existing um, state uh, for for this configuration, right? And if you look, what well, I, I did, I called it TF Wednesday, right? You don't even see a directory here, right? You don't see a, a TF Wednesday directory. You don't even see that, right? <clears throat> so I just wanted to show you how to create a workspace. Um, but again, if I do uh, Terraform um, list, oops, workspace list, it shows me I have a, a deep, a, TF Wednesday and a default, right? And then if I do um, dash help again, I can select my workspace, I can delete my workspace, and I can show my current workspace. Why a workspace is important for Terraform? Well, when you are, say I am working in, let's keep it simple to start out with. Let's say I'm working in Google Cloud and inside of Google Cloud, I have, um, oh, I can't go to my console. Inside of my Google Cloud, I have different projects. I can set up a workspace based on the different projects, right? So I can have a project called uh, Dev, I can have a project called Staging, and I can have a, uh, a project called Production. And I can set up my workspaces to uh, to emulate the workspace for dev, the workspace for production, and the I mean for staging, and then the workspace workspace for production. Why does that matter? <clears throat> because now I going back to the 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 actual um, video. I'm now I'm now isolating my my workspace. I'm isolating my state. My and my code. I'm also isolating uh, what um, the reading of and deleting and back, back and forth of my of my of my infrastructure. Does that make sense to everyone? So basically, your Terraform workspace Let's see if they got an illustration. Um, da, 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 da. right here. All right, Terraform workspace. So instead of me having um all my files all over the place, right, right. So now my development for my environments is I have my development workspace, my staging workspace, my production workspace, and then whenever I'm going to deploy something to the development, to development, I'm in that workspace and I'm going to deploy to that workspace. Inside of, of Google Cloud, they're called projects. So that's the relation there. Um, so in state, if I want to deploy the staging, I'm going to deploy into the staging. And you can see here, AWS, Azure, GCP. That's, that's how this is represented. Right, and so now I can basically take that same code that I had that I had before, um, and for Digital Ocean, and I can go to Digital Ocean and create a workspace for, um, I can create a workspace for Dev. I can create a workspace for not a workspace, but a what do they call it? What is it called in Digital Ocean? Hold on, let me. I tell you in one minute. Hold on, it's called something else in Digital Ocean. It is called. Um, oh, yeah, it's called projects. So I can create a new project in Digital Ocean, um, and I can and 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 create a workspace on my local computer called uh, development inside of inside of uh, creating a workspace locally called development, and inside of Digital Ocean call it the, that project development. Right. So that's what that's what we that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna create workspaces come next week um, in development. You're gonna create workspace staging. You're gonna create workspace in production. 
here's where it's going to get real, real tricky. The instances that you create over, create over here in development, just like I gave you those instances before, that's going to be your development. That's where you play. That's when you that's when you get to mess around. That's when you say, hey, I'm just trying to figure things out, right? And then once you figure things out, then you're going to take that, clean up your code, and then you're going to deploy stuff inside of staging. And then once you staging is where you can go and do your security testing. You should be just security testing back here in development. But you can do your security testing. You can do uh, making sure that the application stays up, making sure people get, get all the bugs and the kinks out, right? Um, <laughs> and then when you get in production, production is the final draft. Don't touch it. Don't tear it. Don't, don't go. Don't do nothing, right? It's, it's, it's in production. If you need to add anything, you need to go back through the steps to add those things again. Sometimes people deploy straight to production. I know um, high, performing, high performing teams deploy straight to production, but they also work through their code in order to make sure that it's okay, right? Um, and then we'll get into, I don't wanna say it where you guys think I'm talking about a venereal disease, Mono repo, right? We get into mono repo. Which one is better? Which one is not? Right? I don't want y'all to think she was like, "What's she talking about now?" Mon mono repo, right? <laughs> I want you to think I'm talking crazy, right? All right. Um, and so they go into about about talking about what workspaces are, what is Terraform workspaces, but the most important piece here is. Each one of these locations, as you can see, the dev Terraform state, the stage Terraform state, and the production uh, uh, Terraform state are all held in their own little isolated area. Kind of like when we're talking about in Kubernetes, when we're looking at, um, what's her name? Fifi, 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 whatever. When we were looking at her, she needed a namespace. She wanted some privacy, right? Old Fifi wanted some privacy. She was already private. She just stayed on the boat, but on a little boat, but that's okay. She needed she needed management. She needed management. All right. So again, um, key points with workspaces, you can set deploy different environments with the same Terraform configuration files. So that same those same files that we use to deploy in our dev environment, say in AWS or GCP or whatever, whatever we choose, I can use that to those same, those same files to deploy in staging and production, right? Um, you can manage uh, multiple dis, dis sets of infrastructure, multiple environments. We can use workspaces, workspaces, isolate Terraform state. It is a best practice to have a separate state per environment. Workspaces are technically equivalent to renaming your state file. Workspaces ensure that the environments are isolated and mirrored. Workspaces are the successor to an to old Terraform environments, right? And so then again, this is what I did. I showed you, I created a workspace. Um, then I can select the workspace. So let me get let me show you that. I can select default, right? So I can come in here and I can say Terraform. Uh, workspace, root form, workspace, um, list. The two are default and TF Wednesday. I can use my up arrow. You can do this in Linux too. And I say now select uh, default. And so now I switch to the workspace called default, right? All right. Let, are y'all keeping up? Is everything okay? And I heard some people leaving and going and stuff. Everybody all right? Does this make sense to everybody? Yeah. Or you lost. Well, we can always play it back because we, we we recording. <laughs> but but you, but do you understand what we went through so far? Yeah, the concepts are, are you know coming more clear. All right. All right. Cool. All right. Find my mouse. Bring this over to here. All right, and then here, create a Terraform plan. So here you can create Terraform 
plan that out in pride terrible so let's go here let's do it let's do exactly what they're doing i hate reading stuff to you and then you not being able to see the commands so let's clear um let's go back up here and then let's select and do tf wednesday because that was one of our um spaces and now i can do terraform plan dot out and we'll say tf wednesday dot tf plan right oh did i spell it wrong terraform terraform all right so again nothing there right the plan is saying, hey, the plan requires a configuration to be to be present. I don't have anything present. I don't have anything in there in, in this workspace, right? But I do have some files that I can throw in there because it's not going to do, it's not going to, what it, what, it, what it actually would do is actually plan out my stuff. So let's do this. Um, let's copy Terraform. Wednesday, um, main until, oh, I need to put it in here. I need to put it in a workspace. Oh, I can't copy there. I got to put it in a workspace. Uh, let me see something here. I need to put it in my workspace. It's not there. I don't have to put it in there. I, I'll just show you how to do that one. How you put it in your workspace. I'm in the workspace, but it's not reading that. If I went over here to Terraform Wednesday, right, and I run that again. You see how I picked it up? So it picked up uh, the the plant that that TF file that I had, right? I just CD'd over to the directory, and it stored my output in this file called TF uh, TF Wednesday dot TF plan. You see, it's it's gobbledy goo. It's gobbledy goo. So when you need to apply, they also tell you if you want to apply in there, you can just do Terraform apply. And then the TF plan, TF Wednesday dot TF plan, and then it will then it would apply, right? The way we've been doing it, we just been making a directory, going into that directory, and then creating our files. But what we really should be having, we should be creating workspaces so we know what's going on, where everything is being deployed to, and keeping up with that. That's what we should be doing. But you will get there, and then you then you use your apply. Then they get into talking about your back end. Again, my back end gets created on my local box. But if I want Natasha or Ashley or Free to know what's out there, I have to create what we call an, an object store. And in that inside that object store, which is your AWS S3 bucket inside of Google Cloud, it's called Object Store, I believe it is. And then inside of uh, um, Azure, I think it's just called Object Store too. Um, but um, what you would do in here is you would hold your you will hold your state of what your infrastructure is inside that bucket, right? And then um, they just start talking about the different Terraform state files, so forth and so on. But again, multiple environments, development, staging, and production. You can do multiple regions and locations, US East one, US EU West two. You can have multiple accounts with using Terraform work, workspace and so forth. So that's the advantage that you get. So why am I showing you that? Okay, I'm showing you that because next week, um, I want you to be able to come in here, AWS, I should type in, uh, let me go back to, we click on AWS. Am I taking me here? Oh, that's the source code. I don't want the source code. Um, let's type in easy to.
latest version that got it, the source code, there's a BPC. Why am I not finding the documentation that I just found? Oh, there it is. Oh, all right. All right, EC2. All right, so resources. So if we go down here, just EBS, I need resources for Elastic. So here, if I want to deploy an AWS EC2 instance, um, let's look at, I want to do Fleet. I want to do that. And I want to do AWS again. I'm going to keep doing it. I don't want to do. Is it called Fleet now? I didn't think it was called Fleet. Yeah, it's EC2 host. Here we go. So if you were going to do an EC2 host, you would come in, create a new EC, EC2 host. You would need to know what, what different instance, instance types are inside of AWS. You don't want to deploy this C518 extra large. That's money. That's money. Let me see. Um, let's go here and do cost. Hey, Tam. So they have a, um, just a little side note, but they have a really good document where you can actually take a look at how you can deploy an EC2 instance in the tutorial. And mm -hmm. it gives you the, um, like the free version. So you can put mm -hmm. in the free instance type into that and wouldn't cost anything. Yeah. Yep, I ain't got there yet. That's on the learn side. That's how oh, you. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Udemy got... does that too in their course. Huh? Udemy shows you how to do it on the free t on the on the free tier, uh -huh. the T3. Yeah. Mhm. Mm so again, when you're deploying in AWS or any of these ones, you need to go find out what the cost is. So you can see here, I just typed in what they had in there. This is three dollars and six cents per hour, right? Per hour. Right, so when you're looking at these, you can cut and paste, but don't <laughs> go figure out what the free version is and so forth and go from there. But here's the other thing too that I wanna show you. Notice that they have a resource here, um, an instance type, the availability zone, the host recovery and the auto replacement. But also look down here, they also have, um, uh, outpost, uh, again, want outpost, but they also have tags. So if you want to tag, if you want to uh, pass tags, like a name tag or something like that, you can do that as well too, right? Remember, arguments are inputs, attributes are outputs. So once I deploy that EC2 instance, I can then uh, do, I, I can then get the output, the ID, the ARN, and so forth, right? So this is just a uh, a AWS EC2 host that we looked at. Um, here's the AWS instance. So, and this is where it, oh, is this data? Did I click on data? Okay, that's fine, but that ain't what I want. So let's go down here some right here. So by default, and this is how DigitalOcean works. Well, not DigitalOcean, but Google Cloud works. So by default, um, I think you get five VPCs inside of AWS, or is it four? I think it's five. You get five VPCs by default. Um, inside of Google Cloud, your network is your VPC. That's the difference. Your network is your VPC. Um, so what you end up doing is you're going to deploy an actual, you can do a couple of things. You can create a VPC, or you can just deploy a, a baseline um, EC2 instance. It's going to take the default VPC inside of your uh, inside of your account. But what I want you to notice is down here is now you're getting into the AMI type, um, and also you need to be where where be cautionary or be mindful of the location in which you're deploying in, right? And then here you can define the network interface. Here you can do CPU credits, but not only that, not only that, 
if you come down here, here's everything that you can do with this EC with this AWS instance, or I should say EC2 instance out the wall. Here's AMI. You can pick the AMI. You can associate it with a public uh, I, um, a public IP. You you can do an availability zone. You can do capacity reservation specifications, CPU core count. You can also even come down here and um, do uh, get password data, right? You can do that. You can do uh, I. Uh, you can attach an IAM instance profile, um, the instance type, the key name that you want. If you already have some keys, you can associate with the AWS key pair monitoring and so forth. So the list goes on, security groups, tags, the whole nine, right? Those are all the things that you could do under attributes. These are all the, I mean, not attributes, but arguments. These are all the inputs. Your, keep scrolling, scroll, keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. The attributes are your outputs. These are things that remember last week when I showed you, I was able to get the outputs of what got deployed from AWS, not AWS, but uh, DigitalOcean. I was able to give you what I could get back uh, in terms of that, right? So here's where you can get back your, your public DNS, your private DNS, your public IP. Um, you can come back with a map of tags. And again, you're going to learn all of that in Terraform. We're going to go through all of this, right? So that's what you could do inside of AWS. You could do the same thing um, if you are familiar with DigitalOcean um, or Google Cloud. You can come here to Google Cloud. You can go to documentation. Uh, let me see. We want Compute Engine is what it's called. Um, let's see, Cloud AI. Uh, they don't have compute engine in here by default. What do they put the thing? Let me see. Here we go. Compute engine. So compute engine is the default inside of digital ocean. So if I go to my cloud and I come over here for digital ocean, if I come down here and I go to compute engine, and I go to VM instances. This is how I make my instances inside of Google, uh, inside of Google Cloud. So in Terraform, you're gonna line up with the same name. So I'm looking for Google Compute Engine, right? And then I'm looking for I want to build an, a Google Compute instance. So let me see if it's instance, it made me call something else. It's Google Compute Instance. So for Google Compute Instance, I'm going to, they give you like a baseline to start with, right? But you can come again, you can add your different arguments, and then you can do your outputs, which are your attributes uh, of what you want to get out of that, right? So they give you your, just a baseline of what you can do. And the same thing, um, if you went back here and you went to Digital Ocean. Uh, I think this there. I think this is theirs. Oh, it didn't click. Oh, on the same page. Hmm. Oh, we're not changing. I don't know why it's not changing there. All right, let me type it in. All right. I maybe need time to catch up. I don't know why it's not changing it. Okay, we'll go the other way. All right, so now, oops, uh, Terraform Registry Resources. Um, and you can see here, it's, it's more of a cut and paste, but you want to do a digital ocean droplet. You can then do, we cut and paste this right here, right? But then you can do the image name, the region, the size, the backups, and so forth and so on, right? 
um, a graceful shutdown, whatever you want. And then here are the outputs that you can get the IPv4, IPv6 address. You can get the size, the disk, and we talked about that. Um, so what's going to be the easiest one for you to do? Um, the easiest to me, the easiest one to do is Digital Ocean, but it doesn't have Red Hat. It has CentOS. Um, the next one is AWS, and then the next one after that is Azure. I think Azure is probably a little more a little bit more complicated. So to get back to what um, what we were talking about earlier with uh, studying, right? Uh, let me go back. Uh, that's not what I want. So inside of Terraform, if you go to the tutorials, and if you went to here, they have tutorials for Google Cloud. They have tutorials for uh, Terraform Cloud, Azure, and AWS. If you click on Start, they actually get they actually get repos. Right. And what they've done is they also integrated, if you click here, they also integrated the inter interactive shell for you as well, too. Right. So you can kind of go through again, understanding the workflow that we just talked about and so forth. Right. How to collaborate, start your interactive lab, uh, interactive lab and so forth. Right. And their lab is their AWS account. Um, so you don't have to put in anything for that. Um, then they walk you through how to install Terraform, and then they walk you through how to build out an EC2 instance. Um, they have a video for it, the whole free tier. Again, you are more than welcome to play around with it or whatnot. But come next week, we're going to sit down. We're going to open up our, our command line. We're going to create a workspace. We're going to then... Uh, create workspaces and your workspaces are going to be aligned with what you have in your cloud and everything that we have in here that we were working on um, like week one um, uh, being able to give a definition of what these do we're going to instead of asking what the structure is of a cron job we're actually going to create a cron job right and you're going to do this on your machines um, you're going to also, uh, you, and this is what's cool about this, you got to pick, you're going to be able to pick and choose, you're going to create, um, uh, or you're going to open up firewall ports on your machines and so forth. Again, you'll be building in the cloud, you can build it locally however you want to. You can also use Terraform or VirtualBox, I'll go, I'll go through that in a minute. Um, you can do, you can find, you can use this to find the IP address. Like, how do you find the IP address? So you can literally write a script um, that's going to go out and do all of these things, report it, put it in some output, take that output and push that output to a GitLab repository. And then I can go through and check everybody's repositories to see what you actually got out there, right? Um, and then for week two, Everything that we did here with, with the games and stuff, right? We're gonna learn how to R sync files back and forth. You're gonna you can build multiple machines because guess what? You use Terraform Destroy uh, and Terraform uh, Plan in order to build and uh, well apply and and destroy in order to uh, create and destroy your machines. You have the power. You're still going to use Linux. You're still, but you're going to be using Linux and Terraform and workspaces, right? And then week three, you're going to start uh, doing, uh, we're going to take that and we're going to go back now. We're going to create users, but now everything you do is going to be automated. You're not, you're not, you're not going to be sitting at the command line like, okay, I'm going to create these users, user ad. No, you're going to write a script and your script is going to run and do your things, right? And you are going to be able to share your ideas on how to create those scripts, right? Um, and then here, where we where we were working and breaking these things down and creating SSL certs, you're going to spin up a HTTPD server and create SSL certs and stuff, right? Uh, yep. Uh, so we got some questions here. Uh, tagging. Yep. Good security options budgets. 
uh, got a question about logging in directly to my shiny new Google instance. Key generation seems to work differently than AWS. What do you mean? So what I'm familiar with on AWS is that you just generate. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Your SSH keeps local or local to your box. So it pulls your SSH keys from your actual um, command line and, and pulls them into the metadata of your actual, uh, into your actual box itself. Yeah, it's totally different than what it is on GCP. I mean, on AWS, AWS, you create an instance, then you create a PIM file. You don't need to do all of that. Well, so I just, so I just log, I can just shell directly into the public IP? Yeah, so what, you, what I would do is, do you have G Cloud installed locally? No, I tried to do that, and I guess um, something happened with my repository uh, repo file where it couldn't find the right version. So no, I didn't. That's why I was trying to log in directly with SSH. Yeah, so if you try to log in directly with SSH, what you have to do is you have to open up a, a shell um, on that on a shell terminal inside of GCP, and I'll yeah. show you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can. And got, then, I, that's where I'm at now. Yeah, create a user, get a okay. user name and password, and then just SSH in that way. Oh, uh, okay, okay. That's the other way. Gotcha. All right. All right, and then what we'll be doing here is on basically every all the items that Team Three had to do. Everybody's going to do every one of these things. You're going to install Wireshark. You're going to learn how to do PCAPs. You're going to learn what a, a PCAP is. You're going to learn how to read a PCAP. You're going to learn how to use the interface of Wireshark. Uh, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more heavy on that, but at least you have familiarity with it, right? Um, what CVEs are and so forth. Week four, when we were down here, how do you test Terraform? Um, how do you test web pages? How do you test Ansible? How do you test TAR files? You're going to do all everything that's on this list is, is what we're going to do, right? So you're going to probably more than likely need a Red Hat instance in order to get started and do these things, right? Um, so you pick and choose which whatever uh, cloud you want to be in, those that don't want to be in the cloud and you want to be local and you want to do something local. Um, you can come over here. I do believe they have um, virtual box. Yeah. So this is not a provider that they provide. This is something, oh, I don't never want to click on and do your thing. Like, what is the problem here? I'm not right clicking. Just go there. You're making this harder than what it has to be. Jesus. All right, so somebody has a virtual box provider out here. So you're going to, you would have to set up your. Uh, providers file to pull this particular provider in, right? So they have it listed right here, right? They say, hey, I want a Terraform required providers, virtual box, the source, the version, um, the provider. And then it's, it tells you right here, I want to create this particular Debian 11 box. And then they have a vagrant location of, of that particular box. Right, and then it tells you how to spin it up. So vagrant up, vagrant down. We'll get into vagrant another time, but uh, vagrant is owned by Hashi. Owned by Hashi. Um, so here you can come in, you can come in and find different boxes. So those that are, let me see, they have some red hat boxes here. Yeah, so it looks like that's some real seven. I don't see any nines. They got some old real box, some old real box recently created. Let's see. Okay, here we look. Here's some a red hat seven nine. They have a real eight virtual box. Um 
but the, you're at the mercy of whatever. And here's here's where security comes in. At. You don't know what's in these boxes. <laughs> this is somebody box. Hopefully they're doing scans on vagrant. Um, um, uh, Hashi is doing a scan on these vagrant files in order to make sure that there's no kind of no vulnerability in there. But again, you want to stick with somebody who's uh, you want to stick with somebody who's uh, who has uh, a, a provider that's well known that had a lot of downloads and stuff like that. And as you can see here, you can do it for VMware, you can do it for Livvert, and then here's a whole slew of boxes you can use: AWS, CloudStack, DigitalOcean, you can go to Rackspace, and the list goes on. You can pull images from boxes from anywhere, right? And um, they have a free uh, offering as well too, if you wanted to play around with Vagrant as well too, right? Um, so what is Vagrant? So here is how we, when I say we, um, infrastructure folks and developers get along together, right? Um, being able to um, have my own little box set up on my machine. So I could literally take this and grab a, a Vagrant box that has Terraform on it, or I can grab a box that has um, some uh, Ubuntu on it or what have you and just bring that box up i can vagrant ssh to that box and start playing with commands locally right here right now right so you can do that too you can use you can use terraform to do this as well too so there are multiple ways to skin a cat i think it's just easier if you're using something out away from your box um if you are not uh, familiar with the CLI in Windows, or you're not familiar with PowerShell or something like that, use something outside, um, which is which will be probably easier for you to get to get a uh, hold to. How many Windows people do we have in a group? We got a lot of Windows people. Okay. Yeah. So the Windows folks are probably easier um to to probably use one of these uh boxes that are i mean one one of the cloud services um but um let me see i don't think i have uh, vagrant installed i know i don't let me just go and take a while because i had not updated this box in a minute so it's going through brew is on if you're on a mac brew is the package manager that you use to install latest and greatest packages so i'm doing a brew install of a vagrant um for now and when i get ready to install i should be able to run this command right here um as long as virtual box is on my machine um because it's you bringing up default with virtual box provider and it'll go through and create this thing and then i'll be able to ssh to that box uh right there so you can install virtual box on your box you will have to install vagrant on your box this is if you're in the windows or even if you're in linux and then you can do a vagrant init and then run whatever whatever images that you want and they got a whole little walkthrough of how everything works um go here to docs um here's the installation here's the vagrant share i can create a vagrant file provisioning the whole nine they have everything right here for you so this is just another way for you to study um how to use terraform how to use cloud services how to set up your own isolation for um, say you wanted to deploy some code or you want to create an application. This is this is what this is. And we do use Vagrant at work um, for isolation. I think Vagrant was one of the first things that they ran. I don't know why this is stalling. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. I'm like, oh, it's going to be a long time. 
Yeah, it's outdated. You need to be updated. <laughs> right, so that's going to be a minute. But you can see it's installed in Vagrant from Ashy uh, for me and doing this thing and going from there. Uh, let me put that in. But yes, any questions so far? No. Okay. I'm going to start recording. I have a smoke uh, question. Um, the package is not auto update. Which packages? Uh, for brew. In the case of uh, Vagrant, there that you use. Mm -hmm. Was already on there. Uh, no, it didn't auto update. You can. I think you can set brew to auto update, but I don't have it set to auto update. But you can see brew is now installed. So if I type in Vagrant. It's trying to do its thing. It's, it's like, what you want me to do with that, right? So there we go. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I can't remember if I got virtual box installed in here. I don't think I do, but um we'll go and try to get that running real quick before we get out of here. Um, yeah. So yeah, Vagrant file has been placed in the directory. So if we look now. You see, before I didn't have a vagrant file before, but now I have a vagrant file right there. And this vagrant file is going to uh, go out to uh, vagrantcloud.com. It's going to look for this box right here. And then it's going to bring this box up for me uh, locally on my machine. Uh, and you can create vagrant files and so forth. And then it, um, since enable provision with a shell script and so forth. So if I wanted to uncomment this out, I can install, uh, I can update this and then install Apache and what have you, right? So it's uh, it's just different things that you could do with Vagrant um, and get it running locally. Um, I know for a fact, I don't think I have VirtualBox installed, so this may fail. Uh, but let's run it and see what happens. Great vagrant up. Yeah, I didn't have it. I know I didn't have it installed. So here it says no usable default provider could be found on your system. Um, examples of virtual box, VMware, or Hyper V. So I would need to install uh, virtual box or VMware or Hyper V. Your Hyper V works on Windows. And then you can have a vagrant box for Linux or a Vagrant box for whatever you want. You can have a Vagrant box for Terraform. You can have a Vagrant, Vagrant box for a console or Vault or something of that nature and, and start playing. That's, that's, that's just another way. I'm not saying you gotta do this. I'm just giving you options um, for, for, what you, for the things you can do. All right? Well, now I'll stop recording.